Hello everyone, today we continue our video about princely or late medieval if you prefer Germany uh, dealing with specifically the let's say transformation from the universal empire to central Europe this is one uh, theme the mm, attempts of power concentration if we have some time we will get to some aspects of the Landa system, but it's important to stress uh, how the German Empire, if you want to call it like this, like in other videos I, I said it at some point it was not correct because it was objectively not an entirely German Empire, but just to be uh, clear, when we look at, of course, what the system had uh, become by the second half of the 12th century was the greatest power in Europe and um, it was objectively a an empire of say moved at that point by by a Swabian dynasty uh, and of course extending with the facies of a universal one right and I made already videos about how and why this holy Roman Empire and every single word of it is perfectly coherent with the imperial catholic tradition um, was however as we come to know it in medieval times limited in a territorial sense and differently from the uh, the previous the, the only empire right and the same can be said for for the byzantine one if it hadn't been for the fact that here the let's say the, the odd was uh, the the already the existence of a of a schism of a western and eastern christendom and the former was not entirely led by the Holy Roman Emperors, at least in theory it had to be. Um, there were some rulers, such as even the English, and other, that, that recognized this, there were non-German uh, monarchs. Uh, as you know, where there, there were you know, kings of the Romans that were fundamentally, uh, act actually also emperors that were fundamentally, think about the French Henry VII, basically, French by culture, Essentially, but think about um, uh, Richard of Cornwall or Alfonso of, of Castile. Um, without mentioning, of course, also in the past there hadn't be there had been um, non-German um, emperors. There had been the rulers of Friuli and Spoleto profiting of, with the close that with Rome had had themselves elected emperors. But that's again. Uh, a topic for another video of the ones that are actually made about the Renovatio Imperi um, that analyze also the the the, the prequel of this, of course, with what was the deal with Rome in the first place and what was the deal with Christianity in the first place, and so those are all things that deserve tons of videos for, forever on end. And I say I promise that if I survive, uh, I will of course uh, deliver uh, those uh, reflections uh, to you through Schwerpunkt. Um what however aside from this broader picture one must understand is that together with it because this is what also the Germans were rightfully proud about uh, in their imperial accomplishment there was on the same German basis a shrinking in power and that's fundamentally what we've seen also yesterday that this entire uh, period fundamentally is uh, it's the, uh, the the contraction of of universal powers, um, but also the shrinking properly of many others, uh, including the national monarchies that had in a sense won, especially as we've seen the English, the French, say the Castilian ones, etc. You know, as a political startled model um, that also. Um, so that had surpassed the system, but were also shrinking themselves in as as regional powers uh, after the, uh, the the 14th century crisis, right? So it's really that's how if if you want in perspective, you can imagine the same um, say uh, anti-traditional issues taking place with this or the rebellions, I don't know, the Hussites, or, you know, the same Jacquerie, they're all sort of intertwined, and they lead straight to the Protestant Reformation, they lead to the the, the fragmentation of Christian unity in the, the, the winning Western Christendom, that had 
in spite of the investiture controversy and all the wars fought, etc. However, seeing the Holy Roman Emperors and, and the Popes actually cooperating and still actually this I'd say after the Germans basically bailed out from Italy de facto, there was also a and eventually an alliance right between uh, uh, between the two again especially after reformistic times where of course the Habsburgs that uh, had uh, secured the imperial um, de facto succession um, would stick with, with the Pope and there wouldn't be other issues like in the, the ones that had happened in medieval, uh, medieval times in practice even though they had not been founded on the same theolo in fact theological issues that you see in, in modern times so this is important just to get the coordinates straight, right? But the idea, again, that um, the Hohenstaufen dynasty that remains a bit like the the top, right? We've seen it in the video about medieval Swabia, that probably the, 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 uh, the Stauffer legacy is the one that makes the German Reich, also in, late, in the later centuries. Um, the great heroes are Charlemagne, are Otto I, but also, and especially Frederick Barbarossa, right? That is the guy who brings the German Empire specifically to the to the greatest heights. Um, and um, the Swabian legacy had always uh, had obviously been the one of the of the fullest Roman Empire of the, of the Mediterranean dream of the reunification of the churches, the reconquest, not just of the Holy Land, but of Constantinople. In all this, after the demise of the Hohenstaufen, basically ends, right? Germany and it, it, it engulfs itself in this dramatic um, chaos that, in, in a sense, has been even overtly emphasized because it's not that, as we've said, Yesterday, before this time, there had been actually a solid state. Uh, all those features that you find princely Germany had already belonged, in a sense, to the German political and institutional mechanism. The, the very sort of private mentality of power, the sort of uh, deep social divide, the, um, the federal nature of the various uh, land and the, the various pr principalities in general. But at least there had been something managing to keep this together, very often channeling conquests down south in, in Lombardy, in, in Sicily, in, you know, in the broader Mediterranean, uh, and um, sort of truly representing a, a universal power, right? One that could rival with Constantinople that was even about just to crush that, right? If it hadn't been for his untimely death, Henry the Sixth would have conquered Constantinople, just like Charles of Anjou would have done if the Vespers uh, had not broken out. So, mm, as we were saying yesterday, in fact, the, the French, uh, by the, the mid-13th century, basically take on the role of, of, of the empire, right? Because they, in many ways, they had become uh, much more imperialistic-minded than the same Germans. At that point, a great part of Germany was not really interested in the uh, in the Roman adventure, in the Italian expeditions, uh, and had done everything they could, like to sabotage this the the, the actual monarchy, the actual German monarchy, to uh, effectively, as it happens during the Great Interregnum, seizing the public assets and uh, uh, concentrating power from their own uh, provincial perspective. And um, this naturally is not a positive thing, right? It is uh, a, a huge opportunity missed um, from a country like Germany that had truly great qualities, um, but also had, and, and unique ones in, in a way, but also had been crippled by this absence, essentially, of a statal history. In its past, yes, there were, say, Western and Southern Germany that were, as we've seen, more urbanized uh, from Roman times, were richer, and they had, in fact, allowed the greatest uh, political developments. It would also later, during the, in fact, princely times. But overall, it was like a gigantic effort that ultimately failed, like in the great um, uh, and tragic ends of the of the. 
uh, of the heroes of, in the Germanic epos, right? There is always like the, the the one who wants to rise the highest eventually by failing, you know, also falls uh, in the in in the worst way in some ways. And so this is in in all the aspects that we have already outlined yesterday, what what is happening at this point, and this takes literally on a, a regional dimension, um, and uh, both um, actually an international dimension and a regional dimension. Internationally, the empire eclipses itself, meaning that for a long time um, the German monarchs are not able to launch Italian expeditions. Anymore, they retry, as we've seen with Henry VII, Ludwig the Bavarian, but it's basically a, uh, a, a failure, at least considering the, the ultimate purpose, especially Henry VII's expedition actually was much more successful in relative political terms, especially northern Italy, um, and it would affect dramatically, in fact, European history. But, um, as you know, the emperor dies uh, in the expedition, there's not a continuity in the presence of a German rule uh, in Italy, right? As it had already failed, like in, in the previous centuries, uh, under the much more powerful Hohenstaufen. Um, this expedition start being sort of, uh, you know, ever smaller, right? You compare Henry VII, Louis the Bavarian, and um, John of Bohemia, you see literally the, the shrinking, right? There are times in history like... Uh, and in fact, these are the years of the 14th century crisis. If you look at the second half of the 6th century, back in the day, the Merovingian armies, uh, at the beginning, there are like 30,000 men strong with, you know, Roman catapults, with forces drawn from everywhere. And as we start shrinking at the end of the period, they're just hunting parties that kill each other um, among uh, siblings, right, you know, in, in the Merovingian dynasty. Um, and this, this of course, uh, as we were saying before, is not a problem just Germany under Gauls. Um, but while uh, out of the late medieval crisis you have a kingdom of England that is a kingdom of England, a kingdom of France that is a kingdom of France, a kingdom of Castile that is a kingdom of Castile, and even a kingdom eventually of um, of Sicily, right, under the, the Aragonese, in, in spite of the, um, the old crisis that had actually, in fact, severed Sicily from the mainland, you do have clearly defined monarchs. You have Arag the crown of Aragon is a bit more composite in nature, but those are actual states, right? Um, Germany remains instead dramatically fragmented, as in many ways it had or always been, but w the way we see it fragmented is because there is no hegemonic force within it that is able to make that fiction that we can say for France, for example, where of course there were lots of decentralized um, signories, but that really and literally obeyed to a single lord, in spite of the, especially of the process of the uh, of, of fragmentation, um, due to the severe offenses from England, from the same within thinking about the Burgundians. By the late Middle Ages, this thing recompacts itself, um, and is, it's even stronger than before. Uh, what happens at, in in Germany, instead, is the creation of these princely states that. Uh, managed to compact themselves uh, in the later Middle Ages, but not to the extent, uh, not on the base of a pattern of a German kingdom, right? Um, and so uh, this is accompanied by also social uh, changes that there is, as we've seen yesterday, an elective um, system like in the other kingdoms uh, of Central Europe, right? But one must also pose oneself the problem how the sort of the Germans lived the fact that they had uh, internationally been recognized to that degree of, of leadership that still continued within uh, the, let's say, Roman prerogative that the Germans at this point had basically monopolized for themselves, um, but in a world that sort of didn't recognize much, uh, uh, say, of their power abroad as a state. Right, and where there were much more powerful neighbors like France, uh, especially, um, and even again, with this let's not digress on it, but there were literally states who were much more solidly founded on publichood, or even within the same Holy Roman Empire. If you look at again the the Italian uh, regional states, etc., those had a profile. It was very different from the one, uh, the much more feudal one, archaic one, that also the the German 
principalities hand um, established at this point. Um, with the, uh, of course, with the two differences within the same Germany, meaning that, of course, the, say, in spite of all the randomness of it, the, the Habsburgs, for example, managed to recompact all their branches uh, in the mid 15th century, so become a regional power, right? That extends also on other, on other kingdoms, actually. Um, but let's say other states, like in the north, in the east of Germany, were otherwise substantially backwards also from general European standards. In fact, the the divides again within the same German territories is is very marked, and as we've seen, the German historiography sort of tended to emphasize even this difference because, especially after World War II, a uh, Marxistic structuralistic approach that wanted a bit to demythologize the empire tended to do um, in a wrong way. I mean, emphasizing the differences when you have to be very peculiar, say very precise about the peculiarities of the of the various states is okay, but you must also maintain a, an overall view of what the empire still was and was recognized as such. Uh, and these are some, th this highlights uh, just by definition all the controversies and sort of the the destructive um, uh, dynamic of the late medieval crisis. That is to say, what happened um, all over Europe, like to wake up with essentially a the sum of, of various regional powers, basically by the end of the Middle Ages, where in theory one is still called Holy Roman Empire, should represent uh, a universal authority, but that nobody really takes uh, any more that seriously in a as they would have done instead, say I don't know, in Ottonian times and Swabian times, when still the concept was already much more reduced from say probably Roman imperial times is makes you really think uh, about the the secularization and modernization of thought, right? Probably the loss in traditional Catholic awareness that in fact would open the uh, the way exactly in Germany. Uh, in that sort of uh, disgregational fashion to the reformation, to the consolidation of the divides of different confessions and it, opening to disasters such as the same Thirty Years' War, by the way. So that's how you easily arrive to very, up to very recent in times when you have to wonder what, what does it mean to, to live in a country that literally, uh, you know, lost one-third of its population in the 17th century due to confessional clashes. You see, in Germany, by constitution, you must... Um, you are obliged by, by the state to uh, declare, say, when you go to study, for example, in a German university, what kind of religion you have. Like, this, in other countries, would be unconstitutional, right? And the reason why this is the case in Germany is because, of course, there are very sort of uh, important. There, there is a positive side to that, meaning that in Germany, really, the various confessions, ha organizations ha are substantially powerful. They, they substantially do support um, that their members, etc. So they they pay. Say that if you go to university, you are of a certain um, creed, you will get some money from this institute. That, that's why you ha must declare it for for tributary uh, reasons, right? But in a broader existential sort of um, idea of freedom, juridically, etc. In many countries in, in Europe, this is, most countries in Europe, this is actually unconstitutional. It's, it would be illegal just to even ask. Um, and um, this tells you a, a lot, really, uh, about the general background. So, um, the, I, I think, maybe it's a bit of a personal bias because I specialize exactly in the uh, early 14th century study a German warfare, Italian warfare. I'm all about the Holy Roman Empire by background, uh, and of course these, especially this, the theaters, intertwine deeply. I think um, this is the single most overlooked um, time and place in medieval history, right? And possibly the most important overall, right? And part of the reason why um, not even historiography has focused on this so much is because it's a difficult period. Because in order to know it, you have to literally study every single damn source that exists on a given um, circumstances. There are a lot of fragmentation. 
uh, as we've seen, you know, the, the, the Germans had 300 states, the Italians had 30 states. Um, and so you barely find anyone that is so crazy like I did to try to, to get into this jungle. Um, but actually pouring out of this uh, pretty sound logic about what these powers were really doing. And so especially the uh, Red Revive uh, German expeditions into Italy, the aforementioned ones of Henry VII uh, uh, in, uh, of Luxembourg, and Ludwig the, the Fort of Bittersbach, Ludwig the Bavarian, as it was called at the time, um, really exemplify how truly alive still before the 14th century crisis the sense of the empire really was right lots of things had already deteriorated these were the first expeditions uh into italy literally from from the time of conradin right 1268 right so consider henry the seventh entered italy uh 1311 with ludwig the bavarian we are in the first half of the 20s um so there the interendum had been deeply felt, but still, right, the context between these two regions, the necessity of an imperial leadership, especially to support uh, the Italian Ghibellines and to influence the, um, not much the, the, the papal policy, but especially reducing the, the Angevin power uh, in the peninsula, and with that, the same French one and one of different allies, like Rudolf II had to, you know, learn the hard way with Ottokar II was allied um, with, with the Angevins, etc., was was so deeply felt in sense. First of all, because um, the Kingdom of Sicily was felt as literally a German legacy. I mean, the Germans had interiorized um, in a radical, as traumatic way, the fact that uh, Conradin had been, it, it, which was true, by the way, had been assassinated in, by the way, an, an unlawful and unchivalric way by uh, uh, Charles of Anjou, specifically. The, the, the Pope w went with it, but mainly was really d decided by the, um, by the Capetian ruler uh, that was very different from, for example, his brother Louis IX. So, admittedly, these were different chunks. Uh, Consider that Charles of Anjou was Count of Provence, that technically was within the Holy Roman Empire, and that's where he... Uh, that's uh, what he used as a launch pad for the crusade against uh, Manfred and eventually the campaign against, I mean, the defense of, Na of, of, of conquered Naples against Coronet. But the idea of Romanity, the fact that literally at the Battle of Markfeld, the largest feudal um, cavalry engagement in, in the history of mankind, the Germans shouted as a battle cry in their own native tongue, Here's Rome! meaning we are the Romans, uh, really should tell you everything about what the Germans were truly about uh, in this sense. Surely, again, it was a, uh, a crisis, it could not be denied, but this sense of Romanity was deeply rooted in that sort of chivalric um, imperial ethos of this, again, warlike... Uh, people that had been, however, disciplined enough to... to um, win the empire to substantially uh, become Roman themselves, not, not just surpassing the old Romans, but actually re, re, uh, resuscitating within themselves, like being as high as the Romans, right? And of course, they would have thought as Germans, because they still believed themselves as Germans, of course, that they were superior to them, and it was the old idea um, that also Charlemagne would have believed. Uh, it's in Ottonian times that specifically the Franks, the Saxons, they, they turned into literal ethnic Romans by institutional formality, right? And that's where you have a Roman Empire. This, that's why you can't say it's a German Empire, uh, even though, as we will see in later times, as you know, in the 15th century, that, that's the coming back day, a signal of the, 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 the perishment of universal authority. It's, yeah, whole Roman Empire, but of G the Germanic nation, the ad. Uh, and that's also fascinating as a as a title, right? Um, and you have also other um, expeditions like the ones of John of Bohemia, but we're talking about really at that point, um, first of all, it's worth noticing that all these expeditions were financed by the same Italian Ghibellines, right? Uh, John of Bohemia would enter Italy just because literally one city had asked his protection against another. And this was going on while there, there were the Habsburgs, 
in northeastern Italy uh, infiltrating the same barbarians were you know ha had been with Ludwig of Wittelsbach uh, in Italy already so at that point it's just a fair I mean John of Bohemia was a knight errant not a not a not a king right let's be honest he died the way he did courageously in a fanatical way at the Battle of Crecy um, more um, more concrete was his son Charles IV that had been with his father uh, in Italy had even allied himself actually um, with the Pope at that point against some uh, Ghibelline signories that had even uh, historically received by Henry VII the, the Ghibelline uh, the, the Imperial Vicary uh, the Visconti and the della Scala had been basically installed by Henry VII at least to that degree of power that it would have in northern Italy that had been recompacted by the Luxembourg at that point. So it's all um, an interesting consequence here. Yeah, Henry VII was the father of John of Bohemia, so you have also this familiar um, continuity. Um, but these are basically the, the last uh, expeditions of, of any of some sort. What you have, as we'll see now, is just basically the Italian Spain to obtain specific feudal titles within the empire and being recognized ever more as um, essentially rulers of their lands in a uh, not that they had ne ever uh, never, never had the title but de facto substituting themselves as even a quasi royal authority uh, into the same peninsula right and so it's so shaded in practice also because here Guelph and Ghibelline start mixing and just uh, in terms of political conveniency, um, but they don't eye out as ideologies, as some historians say. Well, by the late Middle Ages, many uh, scholars go saying, "Oh, there wasn't really any more like that." Actually, the idea of, of the empire, especially, was incredibly rooted, um, and there would always be a space for revival of that kind. It was obvious during the Italian Wars. It was uh, obvious during the same Thirty Years' War, uh, but just because there is a modernistic and, and uh, secularistic perspective we have sort of been prevented from actually knowing that and it's not you know admit it, it, it's just you know the sources are crystalline about this um, but again who does study this stuff in the first place um, so Charles the fourth uh, is, is a smart guy as you know he ruled basically the, the most important uh, part of Europe at that point the Prague of the Luxembourgs uh, is really the heart of 14th century Europe. You have a lot of uh, state building there, you have a lot of, um, of art development, you have Petrarch, you have Cola di Rienzi. Uh, in Prague you have um, a very uh, wise sort of management of the relations with the Avignon Papacy, with in fact the, the Germanic um, it's a imperial role, the, the one of the other crowns in Central Europe, uh, and Charles IV was um, very uh, very aware of this. Was a, a smart ruler. I made a video about his rise to power, um, and um, you see what what a mess actually Germany had become by that point. And he was, as you know, rather ruling from Bohemia. That was not part of the German kingdom, but de facto had been sort of adopted by this sort of at this point German Empire because as you know Bohemia was uh, one of the um, seven uh, and electors and of the four lay ones um, and this is fascinating in many ways because yesterday we observed how technically every freeman in the Empire was could be an elector eventually this had shrunk to this seven institutionally but it was also more like a German thing right it's not that I don't know um, other subjects of the empire, like, I don't know, in, in Burgundy or in Italy, um, at that point would be counted in that regard. So this actually would work in part with, especially the latter's money, uh, and um, historically there had been actually a, per, a great participation, even from abroad to the, um, within the, say, in, in Germany, from, from the rest of the empire, for the actual German ele elections, the one that would also bring, in fact, to the that makes sense to, to, to the same Roman expedition. At this point, the thing uh, takes on a specifically Central European physiognomy. 
And Bohemia is sort of, even if it's a Slavic country, it's heavily Germanized. Um, and it, it, it's a tiny unitary um, block, fundamentally, that, that had at some point tried to hegemonize under Ottokar II before the rise of the Habsburg. The same, uh, the same, uh, the same Germany, actually, during the the second half of the 13th century, uh, and it is very viable for concentrating power by the Luxembourgs that had been called there by the Bohemian nobility, just that was afraid about their southern neighbors, the Aust uh, the you know the Habsburgs that had settled in southeastern Germany and were just next door, and this was done also with the support of of other German princes that didn't want the Habsburgs to be too powerful. So it's always the same pattern, right? An incredible level of balance. Yesterday we see how uh, the Golden Bull worked. Well, why was it? Why was it issued by Charles IV, especially to keep the Habsburgs at bay, so that Albert the uh, uh, the Fort basically um, comes up with the idea of the Archduke, uh, the Archduchy of, of Austria, that is a s title self-conferred, basically. Um, and uh, in order to, because Austria was not was was cut out of the uh, of the formality of the electoral right through the bull, there are lots of interesting relations between the Luxembourgs and the Wittelsbachs. The former are more powerful at this point, but in all of this, what is evident to Charles is that he was powerful and he was also the Holy Roman Emperor. Basically, just in virtue of his Bohemian crown, right? And this is quite interesting because even though he went to Italy on multiple occasions to revive thus what appeared to be like this, this is the ancient imperial right, right? He actually renounced, in practice, to exercise the imperial potestas in the same peninsula, right? Um, and um, this shows you, of course, how. Because it was known that there was no way, uh, like that, there could be an, a renewed expedition. Something it could bring to clashes like they had occurred during uh, the times of the Lombard League, or just uh, to the uh, strenuous op opposition to Henry the Seventh. Um, in more recent times, these are exactly the years of the greatest contraction of power everywhere in Eurasia, right? And as we've seen in our historical region series, basically every single state has the same identical history. Uh, a rise towards, f f say, d especially in Central Europe, difficult compaction in the High Middle Ages. Rise to power towards the 13th century the, to having presented wealth, and then in the 14th century collapse and sort of parcelization into different chunks. But this is futilely. This is basically what happens here dynastically feudally and it was just known that such enormous expeditions could not be mounted anymore so nobody was scared anymore um, as we've seen here there are important titles both here and there in exchange of recognition and imperial authority these guys were north of the Alps they didn't bother uh, the Italians and you could make deals in this regard and it's all a part of the story I made, I made a video Oh, well, okay, well, but we will come back on this topic because it's it's all also the the point in which the imperial authorities found it because still by this point, technically, in order to become Holy Roman Emperor, you have to come to Rome. You have to be crowned by the Pope at least. So you can't quite skip the thing. Um, nor the Pope is going to come to Germany to do that. Um, also because technically they are still allied with with the French, uh, and so there is a lot of composition there between the Guelphs and the Ghibellines. You know in a general sense, in spite of, again, the, uh, the different sides. Look at Bertrand de Pouget, the cardinal legate that uh, is a, he wants to create uh, against the, the Ghibelline Visconti, uh, you know, a papal seigneury, a papal state in, in the Pau Valley, and then this, this is the same guy who allies himself with Charles um, while he, he, he is in Italy against some of these other guys. So it's it, it's really that messed up because the same empire is fragmented and so you cannot follow a rigid dichotomy um, nor really in a political or strategical territorial sense it makes any sense to reason that way um, just there is even a, a sympathy if you want between the, 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 the sides in recognizing that still this thing of the empire was was an opportunity for everyone involved 
for the rulers, for the subjects, um, to define uh, in a moment of crisis where also the elites were basically sh um, uh, securing their own new role, right? That exactly at those higher levels, the, the say mm, uh, spheres of influence, uh, power sharing, etc., had to be defined specifically also on a territorial basis for for good. We can say. Uh, never forgetting what the past had been, what in theory the empire had to be about, never, right? There were different theorists um, uh, of, of the empire, uh, there were some detractors uh, of the same. If you look at Dante Alighieri, Julius Romanus, you have uh, Marcellus of Padua, William of Ockham, you have all these sort of um, fencing, right, at an ideological level, but very often that happens when there is no actual control. Um, locally, and this has to be defined in ways that are basically understood to be lost uh, in great part by this point. Um, so, as we've seen, there was a uh, collapse of, imp of the imperial uh, tax collection system, right? The imperial fisc was practically over. I made a video about the imperial fisc, uh, the, probably the German royal one, uh, in um, that was the one that allowed for an imperial policy to to, lo to launch expeditions abroad, and how this had been eroded is already in late Swabian time for practical purpose. Um, we, this meant unavoidably that the sovereign would um, be supported, would be backed just by the resources of his own hereditary domains or however directly controlled ones um, in fact Bohemia for the Luxembourgs in the 14th century we look at southeastern Germany for the Habsburgs in the 15th there were different areas which the, the various dynasties split the, the branch like the Wittelsbachs yes had the uh, they also were emperors at some with Ludwig um, they, they split in four branches the Habsburgs as you know they had Technically, more than two, but mostly the, it was the Albertine, the Leopold 9 1. Tyrol, for example, was a land of unprecedented power in that regard, in part because it was also uh, through the edge, the Adige Valley, allowing for that mechanism of seigneury on northeastern Italy that the Habsburgs and the Wittelsbachs had been battling on. Um, so, we will cover also these various lands. Uh, hopefully soon in our for our historical regional series so you can understand also the history of the land right and why certain centers of power became so at this point right? they hadn't been much uh, in the same way um, uh, and um, in, in the past today we do not even address properly what these rulers were doing with their policy in the east if not that of course they were trying to seek every opportunity to inherit something uh, and from the other side the same favoring thus the uh, dynastization of power right so that the especially the hope of accumulating multiple crowns so that they could essentially centralize through the small surplus coming however from the sum of all the external ones in in, in, in the in the one the words in which they were settled so that the nobility of the other um, kingdoms would actually erode uh, the power of the crown in the meanwhile and just to create their own uh, oligarchic uh, provinces uh, their own pr private possessions within the same that's how Hungary was destroyed that's how in a longer term um, Poland was destroyed um, Bohemia was destroyed by whose sides uh, never mind but I mean these are all countries that basically lost their independence due to this dramatic collapse exactly in this time um, so you know this as we were saying um, the rhetoric deforms the, um, the the institutions continued to be marked in a way or another by the greatness of the universalistic ambitions of course the Germans never backed down in terms of what they had achieved now by de facto by by habit 
right? Meaning, again, there hadn't ever been in European history a moment in which somebody decided that the empire had to be German. In fact, there were, during the 12th century, already some some nations were questioning, like the, some authors literally saying, who did decide this? <laughs> you know, who would the Germans think to be, really? Um, but, as I was saying before, that's how the continuity went, because mostly that was not much the problem anymore. What was important was for the same Germans to, the, the German princes to rule over Germany, in part through these older traditional institutions. Uh, and so they couldn't quite, given that the, the imperial one was quite prestigious, definitely the most prestigious actually of all, um, they wouldn't they wouldn't abandon it. On the contrary, they even, to some extent, um, boosted it f further from an ideological point of view. Even to the point of greater intransigence, for example, over the papacy, even though at this point the empire could not really impose its power on the papacy like it had threatened to, to do in a much more successful way before. Um, and vice versa, right? Except that at some point they found distance themselves enough not to be scared by one another anymore, and so they sort of reapproached themselves. And still, the imperial election by the Pope, uh, the imperial crowning by the Pope was was normal, right? So, this, this, again, this they, they could, um, you know, fight with one another, but they would never disconfess each other because they both had to gain from each other's presence and recognition, by the way. The same Pope needed the Emperor in that sense, as much as it was through the other way around. Um... The, after all, it, it, it was just a crushing tradition, the one that every elected was tied to, because being an emperor was not just a privilege, it also came with a lot of burden. First of all, in order to be elected, as we've seen, you had essentially to buy the vote to, and in, to prepay that, so to promise, essentially, that when you would have come to power, your power would have been... Uh, I mean, you had to ensure yourself that your power would have been... Um, backed by those you had promised things to, uh, otherwise you would have been a weak ruler. And very, very often, some, especially in, during the interregnum, as you know, um, as we, we repeated yesterday, there were, after all, ridiculous uh, candidates in terms of actual capacity was not even provincial in nature, like local, right? The only exceptional one that made it to the top, really, uh, it was the little count of Habsburg that instead became one of the single most powerful rulers of his times, Rudolf of Habsburg. Um, but even there, not to allow the Habsburgs to actually hegemonize Germany permanently uh, at all. And the Habsburgs could actually extinguish themselves just like the Luxembourgs did. And actually, it's because the other branches did that only one could be reunified, otherwise, we wouldn't even be talking. Uh, perhaps of the great Habsburgic uh, history that came uh, later from that. Um, so up to the mid 14th century, uh, the kings of the Romans and or uh, Holy, Ram Holy Roman emperors as such were concretely conditioned also by papal policy. For example, uh, John the 22nd, uh, was one of the greatest popes in history. I also made a video about him in the crusade against the Visconti. Um, that is the the guy who sent the aforementioned Bertrand de Puget, who was, was a Provencal cardinal, to actually wage a crusade against Milan. It was almost successful. And the Germans are very involved, not much politically, but uh, nationally, because essentially both armies, the, the, the Milanese one and the Papa one, are you know, have a backbone of uh, German men-at-arms, like the heavy cavalry. And we were talking about thousands of them. At this point, the early 14th century, again, the Italian armies are the largest, and the, the Germans are flocking there like crazy. They're paid very highly, and, and they, they're they perfectly integrated in, in the incredibly advanced military system of the peninsula. These are all the sort of... Um, by the way, German knights that had, um, say knights, let's, let's say soldiers that had, um, because the thing is getting blended even socially there, that 
hadn't actually been escaping Germany because of the crisis that had followed after the collapse of the monarchy and um, the, the takeover that many princes actually were carrying out of their traditional uh, rights, the traditional standards, especially true for the ministerialists at this point also disappears as a legal concept because not only truth because they were equal in practice to the other to the to the to the free German knights. Uh, but there were so many, right, especially in southern Germany, hence you find them so much there. Uh, and John the twenty second is as in, uh, an atrocious enemy of the Germans, uh, of Ludwig, I'd say not of the Germans in a national sense, he had plenty of Germans in his army, but of the, say, of the Germanic policy, right, of imperial policy that could repristinate uh, a presence in Italy, and this was the case, uh, these are the years of Ludwig of, ba of Bavaria that uh, fights, in fact, against papal forces as well uh, in Italy, and, um, you know, uh, causes really a a bit of a headache to lots of people, including his Ghibelline allies that are at some point kidnapped, ransomed, but eventually Ludwig. Yes, he attempts to do something. He um, basically seizes Pisa through his Lucchese allies. He tries to... He takes some Visconti in hostage, even though they were his allies. He tries to come to, to conquer Milan when he was coming back to Germany, but he doesn't actually accomplish much, but he makes a bit of money. He actually has the Holy Roman Imperial crown. Um garden in the herbs and he is a happy camper he comes back to, to Germany uh, and he uh, as you know actually reinforces greatly uh, Bavarian power basically makes of Munich the, the, the city that is today say in a, in a European uh, uh, scale of relevance and uh, in spite uh, the, the, fra the later fragmentation of the same Wittelsbachs uh, he is one of the most important rulers of his times, um, and you have no idea of how many crazy things actually happen. I mean, the same German. Th this is very interesting. That the Germans hated each other's guts, particularly like the 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 lower Germans and the higher Germans, so the northern and the southern ones, respectively, were that were serving within the same Ludwig's army in Italy at some point a chunk of them secedes because they actually signed with the pa they signed to side with the papacy and they abandon the emperor and you have this kind of stuff uh, going on all the time with this pre-existing sort of uh, regional uh, uh, divides jealousies whatever um, and again I, I don't think there is anything more complicated in medieval history to try to, to sort out in terms of personal affiliate this is a field of research that is still very open. I'm personally working currently on. Uh, I'm writing an article, um, exactly about one of these Germans, actually from the expedition of Henry the Seventh, that was a hell of a fighter, and we know very few of it. It was the Count of Saarbrücken. Uh, it was a Swabian who followed the Luxembourg. He was married also into the Savoy, etc. And he fought um, in northern Italy with remarkable. Uh, achievements and nobody apparently has ever written anything about him um, and there is a lot um, from at that point mostly Italian chronicles because the German ones do not like there aren't even technically in the same way that the Italians did um, but how is it possible that such a figure is not really dealt with uh, a name like Werner von Homburg for example this was an Habsburg right it was the, of the Homburg branch of the Habsburgs he had his uh, great grandfather uh, was a common ancestor with the rule of, uh, of Habsburg. Uh, this guy died at the siege of Genoa against uh, the Guelphs, right uh, in the Visconti army. He was a minnesinger, but apparently he could splatter uh, the brain of uh, you know the captured uh, Guelph uh, rebels uh, with with his mace, just striking terror uh, in his foes. Um, so it's um, it's this incredibly picturesque time. It's really the 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 the, the moment of exhaustion, of burning out of, of the of the great medieval civilization. In fact, by the mid 14th century, prevents this point also the, the empire to be that that performing. Um, uh, there is this German phase, for example, in Italian armies. Then it 
sort of stops, then there are others, there are the Bretons, there are the English, uh, then from the end of, of the century back, the, the Italian condottieri, basically almost entirely uh, nationals. Uh, but just for saying that there is an important wave, there is an important role that the Germans really have. As I point out um, continuously, like the, the weaker Scandinavian monarchies were almost overrun uh, by German mercenaries in actually in positions of power. At some point Denmark was ruled by, a, I made a video about medieval Denmark, explained that, by German, um, German, German nobleman slash um, mercenary, right, was something that would go on even just with the, say, various uh, dynastic marriages as well for the other Scandinavian crowns uh, later on. It becomes a light motive. It's a moment of, again, of stato disgregation, especially um, uh, in uh, in this countries that had not really had um, in the north much of, a, again, previous public stato order, whatever. In fact, for example, of the German mercenaries that fight in Italy, well, they, we do not have, uh, that I'm aware of, even a single instance of one guy who was settled down there, or was like in Feoft or whatever. They apparently all came back to Germany, which is also very fascinating. Like, it would be much more interesting prosopographically and just biographically to study these individuals. Uh, the, the, the reasons why they would fight there are also f extremely fascinating. I mean, there were, there were I, I don't remember what this was, I should research once again, but there was a, uh, I think it was a Swabian nobleman who um, fought in Italy uh, with the Guelphs, I mean, together with the, the Guelphs against Henry VII, and as soon as the emperor died, he left for Germany, and the Guelphs asked him, like, but, you know, why did you come here at all? And and the point was that this guy was a personal enemy of Henry VII. He said, now that he's dead, I don't care anymore. And he came back to Germany. I mean, we are at these levels of, you know, of actual, of a feud, really, of sort of, as you understand, even very ancestral, primitive mentality uh, of hatred of, of uh, you know, of, of uh, vendetta, if you want. Uh, at an individual level, among these noblemen within the empire, in a time in which it, it's total chaos in some many ways. Uh, incredibly fascinating. Um, so, historiography, especially the German one, of course is, uh, as we were saying before, first of all, there are more military history is not studied to the great extent you would like, in, in Central Europe, in, in Continental Europe in general, uh, the Germans do have a good um, military uh, historiography, but not much for these times at all. Um, and as we were saying, mostly the studies on this epoch have to do mostly with the um, political, institutional, territorial dynamics right within Germany. Um, the uh, on Charles IV that we mentioned before, for example, there is a lot of stuff. Um, in any case, in spite of all this effort to maintain the imperial authority up, um, the gradual weakening of such possibilities transformed the empire, especially as far as Italy is concerned, um, to a what was defined by um, a scholar named Guenet, a machine légitime, which in French stands for like uh, a machine with the purpose of legitimization, right? That's how the uh, Milan, for example, becomes a duchy, right? That historically was not a thing. Uh, Milan has emerged, uh, had emerged uh, as a commune within the Italic kingdom, right? There, there weren't other districts aside from the city episcopal ones. At some point, these guys um, by the title. The same happens with Savoy, for example, at some point. There are other dynasties that emerge, and these are rich, and they can't pay um, the uh, the Germanic rulers to have their titles recognized as faithful subjects of the empire within an Italy that, however, now with sort of the German intervention has a, a few to do with that. And so this is a, a very interesting uh, story. The imperial vicaries, especially in... Um, 
in early 14th century Italy are very uh, very important just like uh, it's a say like saying you know I'm ruling here on behalf of the emperor that's how again the Visconti de la Scala affirmed under Henry the seventh uh, and beyond uh, the last papal crowning was the one of Frederick the third of Habsburg in 1452 um, Maximilian his son uh, proclaimed uh, you know Frederick is the, the guy who basically puts together back uh, back together all the, the various branches of the Habsburg Maximilian of Habsburg is, is the is the big shot he proclaims himself emperor in 1508 without um, without papal crowning right that's uh, again we are in the modern age it's, it's another time but his um, grandson Charles V that as you know was also embracing a much wider uh, universal ambition than say the, the central European one some decade later invented a sort of substitutive lay ceremonial for the papal crowning and as I was reminding before at the time uh, the aside from okay the, the mess that happened even against the emperor during the Italian wars normally now it wouldn't be much of a problem to to receive the papal crown even that way because after all the main problem wasn't the emperor the main problem were the Protestants all right and some other Catholic that however you know, given that the Italian wars were won by the Habsburgs, um, um, say, wouldn't create problems with the the crowning of of this dynasty members. Uh, you know, that hegemonized the peninsula anyway. So um, that's another story. But I plan to start some early modern content at some point because it's it's uh, mandatory to, to pass from there to understand really how long the imperial ideal lived on right and how fervent the the loyalty actually of many subjects towards the holy roman empire really was until the 19th century when if anything that was no more as an inst- as, as a polity as you know with napoleon and secularization um, so the shrinking of the sphere of concrete in intervention of the empire politically and the shifting of this intervention fundamentally within central Europe so mainly north of the Alps um, was sanctioned as we were recalling by the appearance around the 40s of the 15th century of that definition that would become canonic of the Holy Roman Empire of the Germanic nation. This, this is particularly important. Sacrum Romanum Imperium Germanice Nationis. And, and this, what does this mean actually? Well, it means that the same Germans have sort of acknowledged the fact that um yes they are the the say legally through their the continu the institutional continuity the holders of the Holy Roman Empire but at the same time they must reinforce that because um they're less secure about the the importance of the title given the international situation and adding that Germanic nation would somehow be also correct in as much as the Central European, mostly German dimension, had become sort of more self-evident, right? And there is a lot of proto-nationalism going on. I made multiple videos on Schwerpunkt explaining, again, this passage from universal powers to the rise of, of say, of national market. Actually, they had gone in parallel. To the, they, they were still both there but the sense now that towards the end of the middle ages people had started losing track of the idea that the empire was about ruling over other people not being um, again some different split chunk of, of a system that were just claiming pathetically uh, lordship over each other without actually being able to 
right? In a sense, it's also how modernity happened. Uh, as we were noticing, more or less at the end of the Middle Ages, the main European nations, independently from their political unification, were already defined as such. Uh, but this also equates to a disgregation instead of an imperial Catholic uh, power that had been the only purpose for which every human being had ever existed. And then now we simply say, well, but we don't really care, right? We don't want to make that effort to rule to have a solid unitary uh, control in virtue of the possibility of transfiguring mankind under the the rule of a just leader wanted by God and all this stuff, right? Um, this was a, a critical moment. I mean, the, the crusader armies at Nicopolis and Varna had been defeated by the invading Ottoman Turks. Uh, the uh, Again, the, the, there had been rulers, including the Usite George of Podebrady, a king of Bohemia, that in order to, you know, to attempt at least to distract from the fact that it was a, a literal heretic on, on on a European throne was saying something, you know, uh, that you would accept, like, namely, like, let's try to fight together all against the Turks. Um, never mind that I'm an heretic on, you know, on a, on a, on a royal throne in Western Christendom, right? But it, the, the, the picture was objectively disconcerting. I mean, Europeans were more busy f not even fighting against each other for the, the sake of it but say def defining their own polities and boundaries etc rather than looking at the bigger picture which was not much that at any time Europe risked to be overwhelmed by the Ottomans which is a bit too far fetched as a as an idea uh, Gibbon saying you know the you know if, if the Ottomans had not been stopped at Vienna they would have been found uh, on, on the mouth of the Thames. Well, n n not literally, right? Um, so, as you know, I have a massive playlist on the siege of 1683, so I, I, I buy fully into the traditional um, uh, romantic um, nostalgia of, of, of the great defense of Christendom, the Habsburgs, uh, Jan Sobieski, the, the papacy, etc. So the ultra-Catholicism striking back, etc. But European history mostly shows that if Europe had been united, would have wiped the hell out of the earth of anything that existed eastward for a much longer time. Um, and, uh, you know, the Ottoman Empire in many ways did something incredible. Being, throughout its history, basically at war during the 16th and 17th century, simultaneously on three fronts, Right, having a, a huge empire stretch from Ukraine to Sudan, from Hungary to the Persian Gulf. Um, but again, if all Westerners had been united in the clash against the Ottomans instead of being fractured in two um, main chunks battling against one another, I mean, you know, Constantinople would have been reconquered in, in an embarrassingly easy way without any traceable doubt under any historical, moral, scientific um, point of view. Um, so we always underestimate ourselves as Westerners, at least in the last couple of hundred years. Um, and part of the reason is this kind of mentality, right? The fact that, well, it, it was actually fine that the was everything disgregated, that the empire shrank, that the papacy, you know, um, uh, lost power and so on. And so on. No, it's not positive. The, the fact that these countries emerge as something on their own, like doing crazy stuff like against one another, it, it, it's not a positive thing. Admittedly, they had always been fighting against one another, that, that's true. But the perspective of having a power concentration during the growth of Europe that could be channeled, in fact, in this global Pacific age, it had been the ultimate purpose of both, in spite of the conflict, uh, yes, uh, against one another, paradoxically, the papacy in the empire, had been for the actual consolidation of a hell, at least of civilization, like the one that emerged exactly because of the conflict between these two dichotomies, even. Um, so these two powers, uh, their, their, prerog their respective prerogatives. So it's, um, um, it's really um, uh, the, the, the 14th century crisis brought with itself so much of that moral decadence that in any time of crisis really can't avoid but to to observe like it's not that wealth 
had lacked and that there had been particular reasons for which the system had to be shattered. Yes, admittedly, the plague later, but today historians wonder whether the plague was not a uh, actually a consequence of a weakening of society uh, for, through the imbalances that would affect also you know people's health etc um, rather than just an external thing that came and ah you know we had to to crumble all of a sudden right um, it, it's always all the reflection of uh, one thing the other right and so the Germans essentially, and when I say the Germans, uh, as we've seen, the, the kingdom of Germany was huge, it was populated by communities that had barely, on the extremes, anything to do with one another. I mean, what, what does a Frisian have to do with a Styrian, right? Uh, or an Alsatian with a, with a Brandenburg, right? It, it, it's a... It's a difficult question to answer. Of course, a German nationalists would say that they're all German. They, they all speak German. Well, okay, but we're talking about the 14th to 15th century, right? So th there were some... This is what, interestingly enough, historiography points out. There were, again, certain corners of Germany that the same emperors truly didn't care anything about. <laughs> that, that really, of course, for maintaining power, there were foreign countries were more important in their policy than some again, German communities at, at the fringes with, with other areas that were mostly somebody else's business, including local private princes, in fact. Um, why did the Anseatic League prosper during this time? Because essentially it was a, a weak empire and weak Scandinavian monarchies. Because what kind of potential really does the, the, the Anseatic League per se have? Right, they are a cluster. It's just a cluster of different sit towns rather than cities. Alone, and as soon as the, the the Scandinavian monarchies reinforce a bit themselves, also the German principalities do towards the end of the Middle Ages, this thing basically goes under. Um, so again, the the positivity, even of certain narratives, including the ones in. In fact, also in the nineteenth century, part of where I made a video about that, as you know, a couple of months ago that were stressing, ah, the Germans should have not concentrated themselves in Mediterranean, should have gone in the Baltic. What for? How, how do you compare the, the, sh the, the traumatically incomparable wealth of the Mediterranean with the one of Northeastern Europe? It doesn't make any sense. Um, of course, every, and th this is evidenced by the fact that every single German dynasty that... Um, succeeded on the throne, independently from the, the Guelph and the Ghibelline sort of background, they did exactly the same thing, continuously. And you're not more intelligent or capable or, or morally worth as a human being than a 12th or 13th century German monarch. You aren't. You don't even know what it means. Um, and so, you know, that, that's the point, right? The 19th century brings on the fore uh, ideologies for radically inferior people that need nationalism and or socialism because they cannot afford to accept to be lesser human beings. And that's the, the, the single most important aspect that one must forcefully, violently understand, um, without which it's completely useless to study any trace of history. Uh, just do something else, change job otherwise, but, but you're not going, going too far with that with anything uh, if you don't really understand this, this very concept. Um, so there is um, uh, th there is a sense again that, that much is changed also by the time of the Italian wars, Maximilian uh, of, of Augsburg like uh, the end of the 15th century. Um, and all these dynamics had an impact within the different regions of the empire, right? Um, relevant consequences, even if intermittent ones, manifested themselves within the same single political formations, of which the dynasties in power were title holders. 
So again, as areas, we can look during the 14th century, the Duchy of Bavaria for the Wittelsbachs, the Kingdom of Bohemia for the Luxembourgs, and especially in the 15th century, the Alpine Dominions, uh, today's uh, Eastern Switzerland, Tyrol, and Carinthia for the Habsburg. Um, the, the duchies of Austria and, and, and Styria, I made a video uh, about uh, each, were at some point hijacked even by the Hungarians. You know, Mat Matthias Corvinus entered Vienna at some point at the head of his black army. I made a, made a video about that. Um, so by some point, like the Habsburgs were even that particularly weak um, and fragmented. And they, they, there was nothing, again, deterministic about them taking off the way they did. Same, again, with the, ex the, the, the male extinction of, of the Luxembourgs, all right? The fact that we're also, of course, married into one another, so this facilitated the inheritance of all these blocks, etc. Um, I made a couple of videos on the introduction in the series uh, that I made about the modern history of the Habsburgs that deals with specifically the, um, the Habsburgic hereditary lands and then Bohemian. Next time I want to make... Uh, Hungary as well um, but um, we can make recall something for example the fact that in Bavaria Ludwig of Wittelsbach had a unitary text of territorial law drafted Th this was called the Oberbayerisches Landrecht um, and this represents like the beginning of a we've seen it yesterday even with with the the Freie Reichsstätte um, the, of, of an awareness of the sort of political institutional formality in the de facto say independence we can say or at least say still subject to the empire but still as an organism that can go on by itself has a specific local law that had been working up to that point that way. I mean, this was traditional, right? But the fact that somebody would draft this as properly a, a, as a unitary legal text and not like in the previous century you would have just to ask uh, every single local tribunal how they were habituated just to uh, judge um, themselves within the community, etc., is remarkable because it means that within the same Bavaria, in this case, you have enough power concentrated at least at some point, because this thing eventually would split again in, in four chunks, um, for dynastic reasons, and this tells you how dependent, in fact, these reforms were also on private power, and so these princes, that's we call it princely Germany, um, to uniform, or at, at least attempted to uniform local uh, justice, right? This is something that was happening also in other areas of Europe, and um, in Germany, of course, witnesses the uh, the construction of some important prince, uh, princely um, authority within these lands that up to that point had felt also like the local communities. This were, we say, again, Bavaria here, but Bavaria again is a sum of lots of things, right? It's not like that this pack like there are some districts yes the Duchy of Bavaria exists as itself but within it there is a plethora of of, of jurisdiction lay ecclesiastical uh, there are towns there are all different um, houses uh, estates etc and you had to make sense of this mess by trying to uniform uh, to, to at least even just fix right this laws and how th these communities regulated themselves in order to rule them with a greater uh, control. Ludwig the Bavarian, again, as we were saying before, was was a uh, very efficient administrator, uh, right? And uh, he would invest much in in the towns and trade, all this stuff, and made of Bavaria um, also thanks to his personal imperial title, but lots of other things, including the fact that he had managed to defeat and capture in battle his cousin Frederick the Third the Fair, not Frederick of the Holy Roman Empire the Third, the father of Maximilian, I'm talking about the, the Duke of Austria. Um his cousin, right, the, his grand the, their grandfather was Rudolf of Habsburg for the both of them. Um 
and uh, and so even if that battle had gone differently, right, we wouldn't perhaps be talking about Ludwig the Bavarian, at least for his accomplishment in that regard. Um, this is incredibly relevant. Uh, Vienna equally, again, and especially Albert the Fort of Habsburg. There was, there was a, a lot of reform. This, there was the foundation of the local university. There was the elevation of the Duchy to the Archduchy. There were, there were a lot of things going on in southeastern Germany, thanks to these enlightened rulers. Um, more in general, uh, in the Kingdom of Germany, um, it is possible, as the historian Mora did, distinguishing the areas where, as we were saying before, the imperial authority is perceptible with regularity, the one in which it is felt episodically, and the one in which it even doesn't ever show up. All right, and of course the areas where it doesn't show up are not really um, uh, the ones where the, the the sun smiles particularly upon, <laughs> to say the least. Again, uh, in this video is, uh, I always stress how you know uh, the, the the places were less organized and subtly built were of course the worst in which to live and the weakest ones that eventually were swallowed without too much representation later. Um, so. Uh, I, I like to use the term uh, federal because, if anything, uh, say in a broader sense, this is what Germany was and remained uh, to this day. But of course, we can't even speak properly for 14th, 15th uh, century Germany, its kingdom, of a true federation recognized uh, in, in all these various elements, right? Um, we can't even speak practically of true forms of coordinations between the various uh, territorial chunks of the empire. You really can't, because there isn't such a thing. These guys are basically all competing against one another, and of course they cooperate if there is some ben beneficial, say, there is some mutual benefit something negotiated, something exchanged. For example, there is a great need. Um, I mean, during the Interregnum, you have everybody grabbing everything they can in a desperate way. Then, after that, they realize that they grabbed sometimes places that are too distant from one another, so they try to exchange themselves, uh, these territories, to rationalize, to compact their, um, their territories. But if you actually look at them, and we were telling it yesterday, looking at a map of 14th, 15th century Germany, if you compare it to the to the previous ethnic duchies of the empire that had somehow remained relatively uh, well defined up to the collapse uh, of of the monarchy, uh, approximating very much what what I'm saying here. You see that, I mean, you can barely recognize those, which, after all, are still the ones that, under this filter of intricate uh, jurisdictions, are still the same German states, the same German lender today. I mean, yes, you can identify a Swabia, you can identify a, a Bavaria, right? You can, you, you know, Saxony. Uh, but even the boundaries of these territories are ever more connected, not with the early ethnic public districts, but rather with the dynastic possessions. Right reason for which you have again multiple Saxonies today in Germany, um, even in territories that historically were not Saxon, but uh, in, in medieval times. But that sort of evolved from there, just because that how the House of Saxony, as such, began to accumulate territories somewhere else, and so it, it's more like you under you understand how it was built, right? So it, it's really that messed up. And again, this is the the country is so huge, and so populated. Because let's not forget that there were you know, right, we're not talking about the wild 12th century Germany yet to be deforested and colonized. The, the country has grown, right? There are lots of people, right? The the, the same towns, they're, they're not as uh, evolved as we've seen in other neighboring countries like Flanders or Italy, but they, I mean, some of them are large. But on average, they have been spreading, and, and because of this political fragmentation, they have been spreading also in a relatively uncontrolled way. 
or at least in a way that you can make a leverage from like on locally to alter etc but it, it's it's such a big system that in that regard again i don't know you you're an Habsburg ruling from from austria you you're not I mean, you're you're going to be particularly interested, even in places as far as Frisia or whatever. But most of the in between uh, in in this frontier is it's not even the, the it's not the single most important thing that you're thinking um, when you're awake at night, you know, because of all the other issues that you're really having at so many other level. Um, so considering this as a wall is somehow courageous because it. it it wasn't really seen, um, if not in terms of, well, if somebody enters that from the external, if there is an invasion, whatever, can be upsetting. But it's a bit like what happened. I mean, there are greater problems. Pick, for example, um, the Swiss Confederacy, that in the ancestral lands of the Habsburgs arose and began essentially to um, to erode all the, those territories, claiming it on, on its own. And the Habsburgs suffer, as you know, also bloody defeats. At the ends of the Confederates, um, the, the the other nemesis were, were the Burgundians uh, uh, of the Albanians that eventually would, as you know, make the Habsburgic marriage and bring the uh, Flanders, a part of them at least, un uh, under most of, most of it, under the um, say, as a possession to the Habsburg. Um, but um, Picking the Burgundian state, this this had emerged dynastically in a similar way, like taking pieces all across the essentially the France and part of the whole Roman Empire. But how did France invade the empire? That's not how it happened, technically, at least not at that point. It was more just like a continuous sort of. Um, you know, elaboration and expansion and creation that um, occurred relentlessly and with enormous, um, uh, let's say, negotiations. And yes, also wars, but fought not on that national basis, but on the basis of the incredibly complicated, and this is true especially for Central Europe, for the era of Germany, jurisdictions, possessions, lordships, uh, whatever, um, in, um, uh, in, a, in a way that you had to deal with very different weapons, let's say, than merely, oh, okay, you just stepped in a territory, because there wasn't, you see, the, the national concept was not prevalent in that regard. They cared much more about the status, right? Think about the Burgundian siege of noise, but the, the sort of um, acceptation again of agreements of this is not even to say that uh, of course a Burgundian power most, was mostly French was not seen still as a threat by the Habsburgs of Maximilian at that point um, for the same Germany right let's not think that the concept of Germany there did not exist uh, either right it, it was important but it was important in that case because the Burgundian state was at least for German standards a much more compact powerful reality uh, than most powers, especially the Habsburgs, that were, say, from the other side of the empire, were at that point considerably um, powerful themselves, but again, had still precarious means to cope with, right? So um, it's always at that level of uh, potential instability, of, a, of collapse from a moment to another, and um, the, the land, the political, and also the military landscape of the country is um, much more desolated, one may think. I mean, robber barons were a typical feature of these times. I mean, the 14th, the 15th century, the soldiers of fortune, this sort of thin uh, barrier between, or, you know, impossibility even of distinction between the a mercenary, a robber baron, but even just a local nobleman, because that's who they were. This is a let's always remember this. This was a country dominated by the nobility, right? Here you do not have things like I don't know in Italy where there are yes, it's still an aristocracy rules, but there are citizens that rule over cities that rule over lords. In Germany, the princes rule, 
And if you're born in Germany, either, either you're a prince, which is of course like a, a very few people compared to the rest of the population, or you are literally somebody else's person. Right? Reflect on this concept. This is something that happened in Germany up to very recent in time. That was the actual country. In many ways, it wasn't changed uh, over the centuries in that regard. Reflect about this when you think about the, let's say, the characters of national identities, or how they come up to be, and, and how their mentalities are molded, etc. Because you can't quite escape this. You can't quite flatten everything and projecting on different countries realities that were not their own, politically, militarily, or socially. Um, you must always search for that specific sense of human character that made these people the, the ones they were, really. Um, consider that, yes, Germany had some primates. For example, at the end of the Middle Ages, this was more or less altogether as populous as the Italian peninsula. It, 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 by the end of the Middle Ages, it had reached, thanks especially to the towns that had remained, uh, in this sense, also a bit more autonomous, the same level of technological development uh, of Italy. This is, we will see it in some military history video. Um, but at the same time, um, it was, uh, given its extension, it, it was really enormous, right? This was bigger than modern Germany, always remember that. Um, was modest in terms of, for example, demographic density. Urbanization was modest as well. Um, and um, even the development of monetary economy in some regions, especially the northeastern ones, w was pretty scarce, right? Uh, still, at the time of Frederick II, the same Prussian monarch said that Pomerania was... Uh, actually, Prussia proper was uh, basically like, uh, say, less productive than Siberia, right? It was just sand, literally. Well, Prussia was a bit far more east, but of course it was German as far as, uh, you know, the the German communities, of course, had established there during the Middle Ages. Um, and that also makes you think regarding what actually brought certain systems to develop, for example, in more uh, authoritarian, militaristic direction like the, the Hohenzollern would, would provide. Because initially, at this point, the Hohenzollern are rising, but they're nothing special just per se. Um, they make it uh, as electors of... Of Brandenburg, but they fundamentally just, uh, they, they weren't even at, at the top, but gradually in centuries and for different accidents, or at least something that at some point was not a policy of power, but it, that in fact country merged in the way it later became uh, so successful to unify the entire Germany. Um, so we're thus very different in any case from, and very distant especially from the perspectives of power concentration that were at this point um, persecuted by by the monarchies of Western Europe. Right, well, there is literally no comparison uh, in, in, by scale, right? However, uh, there was a great development in this last two centuries of the Middle Ages, uh, starting from the Zollendness Kuri, the Oftage, uh, the um, definition of a representative organism. Right. Uh, this would be essentially the Imperial Parliament, the Reichstag. Uh, which is the same name of the German parliament today, which in fact takes the name properly from the imperial duty, um, which was incredibly relevant as an institution um, as it ideally encompassed the entirety, not just of Germany, but also of Bohemia. Uh, and um, in theory, like like all the, the lands of the empire beyond these countries, uh, it was the Reichstag was characterized by the growing regularity of access 
of represent uh, of representation of presence also of the towns this was particularly important um, and obviously of, of the registration of deliberations right this why, why is this important well and how does it connect with this well because um, you see traditionally uh, in the off Taga back in the day the 14th century emperors had reunited according to tradition the lay and ecclesiastical principes so literally the princes of the empire those who were essentially deemed to be worthy enough to decide for the country that's the social divide I was talking about before there are the princes that rule if you're not a prince you do not rule you belong to the prince as a person you're a person who belongs to another person you're a lesser person that obeys to the higher person these higher persons are the princes and they are the ones that count they are the ones that take decisions they are the ones that rule there are lords in their own land and that everybody works for and fights for right and they don't have much to say about um, I made a video by the way about the Landsknecht that uh, in the 16th century exemplify a bit also the, the, the social instances that the emperor uh, had managed to 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 serve like to even establish this statal army of some sort that however ha was peculiar to this very still archaic society and that made a lot of leverage on the concept in fact of knecht of literal servant of the state uh, because that's basically what Langsknecht means um, and uh, that it's as if these guys had maintained a that the, had been redeemed in their possibility of w being soldiers, so wearing the chingolo militaris and having part of that knighthood, literally, uh, even if it wasn't quite the same, but conceptually was the same. I mean, there was one of the, the estates of the empire was also the knightly one. One of the knights of the empire was very important in a say was one of the least important compared to the to the electors, etc. But it was still represented. Right, it was a sense of that order that these were chosen people by, by the emperor as divine medium that still, you know, uh, uh, continued the, the 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 Catholic tradition, in a in the that's in the truest military sense of the of, of the term. And um, and so, you have the eventually. The Langsknechte declined because Germany again didn't have the social basis to produce that kind of, of of military class on a longer term, because the aristocrats rule, right? It's the princes who rule, and there is nothing outside the princes in Germany, right? You could be at best a uh, free city of the empire, isolated in in a sea of princes, that was just granted by the particular order that the princes with the emperor had established. This is Germany, right? Remember this. This is Germany up to very few centuries ago. Um, the entire mental structures, the entire cultural identities, the, the, the entire sense of how the world is designed revolves around this rigid hierarchy. Nothing was born recently. This this is something that the Germans had since the, the, the early Middle Ages, right? Um, and even before telling the truth um, against the idea of let's say abstract freedom that that's not what the, the traditional societies had ever le learned or known what it was right there was a rigid hierarchy based on the quality of individual people um, and it was ruthless and rightly so um, the um, sense here is that the more people you have represent say the more of these um say the it, it's what just said by the lungs next right there there are some estates that emerge in the empire because when towards the later middle ages especially the Habsburgs managed to consolidate some sort of regional power they start making leverage on these other elements that were below the princes and that had something to say thanks to the emperors again the free cities of the empire the knights the the, the lungs next later the the uh, the uh, say the various 
estates, right? They were not necessarily, in fact, territorial, right? Or specific communities geographically uh, meant. Um, and that sort of helped, still in a world, again, dominated by the major electors. Um, and, and still, that was trying to sort of put in together the, the rest in, in a way that would help structuring for this hierarchy. Um, and given that this was, let's never forget it, an elective monarchy, it's obvious that any element that you can inject into the system can do. So it's a great opportunity to, um, especially in the 14th century, this, this is the, mo the greatest divide. In the, say, the first half of the 14th, uh, second half of the 14th century, first half of the 15th, these princes are mostly busy securing their own uh, power so that nobody can challenge them in the empire. After they've done this, there is enough power for single principalities to emerge to original level, the Habsburgs, namely in the second half of the 15th century, that can start acting in a monarchic sense, um, even without reaching the, the capacity of ruling the entire country. Um, uh, effectively, but uh, doing so through the concessions to other estates that were below the princes um, and that uh, were in many ways just a way to sabotage other princes without caring too much for the overall order of the system. So that, yes, there is some compaction in the early modern age, of course, territorially, politically, um, but it still passes through the further consolidation of the ancien regime within these communities. So that there, actually the system expands because Europe is growing. And so, as always, within the ancien regime, you have an absolute growth, uh, increase of quality of life, etc. But in relative terms, the the hierarchy is consolidated. Right? So... It's a, it's a very interesting way, this is valid not just for Germany, but a bit for all of Europe and beyond, how to see how the ancien regime really worked in terms of seeing yourself within this hierarchy. Um, and I think it's one of the most fascinating aspects uh, of the wall, frankly. Um, so, tomorrow we will talk a bit more about the Lenda, uh, the territorial states, and in fact how these had come to even develop some uh, territorial states, parliament, parliaments on their own, uh, and so how s some state building was successfully achieved. We've seen it before with this issuing of certain local laws uh, recognized, but again, the events, especially of first half, the, the Essentially, the halves of the 14th and 15th century are, are four distinct times, eras, respectively. There are different dynamics going on, right? Some continue throughout the period, but it's never a linear thing. You always have some important ups and downs uh, and enormous difficulties uh, from everybody's side to try to keep control. Uh, but that's how you also built civilization gradually. That, in fact, that's one of the most important things that doesn't matter how difficult the system was, it was still uh, capable of providing with some important level of power concentration. We'll see it soon also because, well, we have to end this, uh, this tripled video, let's say. Uh, but I may have something in store about Roman law in Germany that illustrates a bit how uh, the the same German juridical culture was evolving uh, in these years um, and beyond mostly uh, thanks to the the development of institutions where these rights these mechanisms were were uh, were safeguarded by an authority by a state by by a public power, and so this can't be unrecognized or unseen or uh, whatever. So it's it's really something that you must um, you must appreciate. You must concretize, right? It's not just about a vague 
idea big dimension it, it's about every single state it's about every single thought and you know shade that you can grasp to see things uh, in depth um, for today however I stop it here uh, I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content as always I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time bye